Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Be Is For Build. In this episode, it's all about how to buy cars at Copart. Copart is a website that I use to buy all my cars. I get this question emailed me, to me a ton, so I think it's time to make a video detailing exactly how I go through buying cars at Copart. Stay tuned. All right, guys, let's just jump right into this. This episode is proudly sponsored by Copart. Um, we have been in contact ever since the um, the uh, Rebuilder Challenge, and we've been wanting to do an episode together, so thank you so much, Copart, for sponsoring this episode. Um, I get emails all the time. I, it's like the number one question I get asked is about Copart, so I really wanted to make this episode. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. We're going to talk all about Copart, and I'm going to try and just dump a bunch of knowledge on you guys so you can get the best deals for yourself. So um, straight off the bat, signing up. I signed up with a brand new account. This is kind of what it's going to look like. You need your driver's license. You submit a picture of your driver's license to prove who you are. Um, oh, one interesting thing I did want to mention, and I'm going to figure this out in the middle of the video. Hopefully I won't forget. Let me write a note. I want to show you guys the locations of Copart. Uh, Copart has a bunch of international locations too. I got a lot of comments in the last video um, that they're like, oh, this doesn't apply because I'm not in the United States. Not true, actually. People buy it from Copart internationally all the time. So uh, I'll try and figure out um, uh, a way to show you guys how many of those there are. Uh, I do want to point out that, you know, you guys are probably thinking, oh, he's just doing this not because they're the best, but because um, they're sponsoring him. Not true. Back in February 8th, before I ever talked to anybody at Copart, um, I made an episode uh, revolving around this stuff. But I think because I get so many questions, that episode is probably a little too buried, a little hard to find. So I wanted to make a new one. So um, signing up, sign up with a brand new account. You get a thousand dollar deposit right out of the gate. The way the deposit works is you get 10 times the amount of money that you put in as bidding power. So for an example, if you put in $200, you will have a $2,000 uh, bidding power, meaning, meaning you can bid up to $2,000 on any vehicle that you choose. Uh, I normally keep mine around six, seven, eight thousand bucks just in case a couple deals fly over the screen. So I leave very, very, you know, happily just leave about seven hundred dollars worth of deposit on there. One time I did decide that I wanted to take some of that back off because I didn't think I was going to be buying a car for like another year. I was wrong. I definitely did. Um, anyways, you just uh, there's a, a way to submit that you want to get your deposit back, and then they send you to your deposit back when you want it back. Um, so. You have your account, you have your deposit, you add some money in there. In this account, uh, by default, you have a thousand bucks. And let's use that as an example. Uh, the next thing you want to do is look at the cars that you want to buy in the state maybe that you're in. If you want to buy at a local yard or you buy at a state outside of your yard. And we want to be looking at, um, well, one thing that I look at, I should say, I don't, I don't know if you want to be looking at it. Anyways, is the license required states and the no license required states. All of these states that are green are uh, no license required states. So I'm here in Oregon, meaning I can buy any car at the Oregon Copart um, yard without any type of dealer license at all. In the yellow states, they have a little bit, a couple different requirements. I just bought a car in Washington, so I was able to buy a car in Washington. The, some of the rules differ and you want to look up that state on Copart's website or just give them a call, give the yard a call, that's exactly what I did actually. Um, and they can tell you a little bit more about maybe what the rules are and stuff like that. Washington, it's basically like if you're a private person, I, I don't want to get this wrong, but it's, it was something like you just got to promise you're not like parting out cars or something else like that. If you're buying a car for personal use, go right ahead. So that was me. That was my case. I don't know. Call the yard if you're interested. Now the gray states mean that you need to have a uh, valid business license, like a, a, a dealership license or some sort of business license for that, and um, or go through a broker. So um, I have bought a car in Reno, Nevada once. That's where we bought the Plan B, and I used a broker. So on Copart's website, they have this massive list of um, brokers that you can select from. And um, I use one that's going to be way down on the list. It's called Auto Bidmaster. Oh, wait, it's probably going to be, it's right here. Uh, I used Auto Bidmaster because I saw that they are headquartered here in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I just got an email from a kid yesterday saying, oh, they, they seem to have some strange reviews. I'm not really sure if they're legitimate. 100% legitimate. I talked to them. They're really good people. You guys, this is one of those businesses where just jump on the phone, talk to somebody, you know, that type of stuff. But I um, have no affiliation with Auto Bidmaster, but I have used them before and I had a great, um, great service and you know it worked out really well so um, if you want to buy a car that's in one of those gray states which I'm often looking at cars in California you gotta get yourself a broker through Auto Bidmaster they'll actually give you a PayPal bidding ID and then you can do your live bidding through them which I think is really really cool and I was happy about that so um, once you got that figured out it's time to go ahead and search so um, hang on sorry I'm getting a phone call 
Oh, it's from my mom. Hi, mom. Um, you uh, you want to go ahead and search uh, for your car. So here's one thing that I normally do in my safe searches. I have um, the yard that I normally buy at. That's my local one. So Portland North. Um, let's just take a browse at that for this uh, this example. So you on the left here, you can search by location. You can search by um, make, model, all sorts of different stuff. Sorry, that's on the right side. Um, so you know if you're looking for a um, certain car like. Like I always uh, browse for Supras, make sure that there's I'm not going to miss anything. Um, so we got the year range, and let's just say that's my zip code, and let's just say you know within a thousand miles of my zip code. Actually, you know I could probably just look at the entire United States. So there's not much up for Supras. Anyways, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and use the entire yard, um, the entire North Portland yard, as my um, example, so we can talk about um, auction types. So as you're looking through these cars, you're going to find a couple that maybe look cool for you. Um, I'm going to talk about damage type and auction type. And let's just say Audi All Road. I love these things. I'm going to buy one of these eventually. I'm not going to buy this one. I've seen this one at auction about five weeks in a row. So um, sometimes that can be a sign. If you're, if you're shopping for a car, I highly advise you keep watching every week. Watch the cars go to auction. You can start to mentally kind of, or, or even grab a pen and paper watch the prices that they're selling for, write them down. That way you can kind of gauge the market for the amount of damage for that car, for that year, with that miles, how much they're going for. That way you don't just jump right in the deep end and spend too much money. Um, so, uh, auction types. Um, I guess I don't have it displayed right here. Let me, let me uh, pop open, let's just jump into this one right here. So in the, um, in the auction somewhere, okay, right here, you're gonna have a sale type. So they're not they're not called auction types, sorry, they're called sale types. Um, this car is a pure sale. And the way, this one's the simplest way to understand. Whatever you bid, whoever has the highest bid wins this car. You are committed to buying that car and you are, you're buying it. Um, by the way, if you do wanna back out of a sale, uh, I don't recommend it, but you, what you can do is it's a 10, I believe it's, don't 100% quote me on this, but I believe it's 10% of the final auction price or $400, whichever one is higher. So for instance, I bought a Range Rover not that long ago for like $2,300. I didn't want it in the end. I gave them $400. I said bye-bye and I didn't have to have that Range Rover. Uh, it was one of those things where I was in my office. I didn't have time to do any research. I bought it sight unseen, um, kind of as an instinct, which I do way too much. And um, when I got to the yard and checked it out, I was like, no, no thanks. I'll, I'll give you guys the money. So um, that's pure sale. Another one is um, minimum bid. So let's try and, well, I'm not going to find one for each type, but um, minimum bid is a, uh, okay, I got lucky on this Jeep. So what minimum bid is, is the seller can sometimes uh, place a reserve price on the lot. And once you go over the reserve, it'll let you know. But also it means that the um, the seller, oh wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I think I have these all open right here. Minimum bid, here we go. Sellers place a reserve price on the lot. The minimum bid is not surpassed during the auction. The seller has until 5 p.m. on one of the business days to accept the bid. So that's actually what happened with me in the Range Rover. It was, I was like, oh, 2,300 bucks. I'll just, you know, whatever. And I didn't pass the minimum bid, but the seller, uh, the seller finally just decided to approve my, my price that I bid at, um, which gave me the sign that, man, that was probably a piece of junk car. So, um, Anyways, so that's what minimum bid means. Um, on approval is the other type. And so when you see on approval, that means that they are not released to members until the seller notifies Copart of the acceptance of the high bid. In some instances, the seller might take a while, a couple days, and the seller can counter offer. So when I was uh, first buying cars at Copart, there was a car that was on acceptance and um, it was a 370Z, Nissan 370Z, and uh, I got a great price on it and the seller countered. So let's say I got it for like 5,000 bucks. The seller countered and said, I want $7,000. Then they give you the option to counter back. And I said, okay, uh, I'll do 5,500. And then the seller countered and did 6,000. Eventually we didn't find a middle ground and then I did not get the auction. The seller can uh, accept your bid. So those are the three um, bidding types. And this is why a lot of people look at Copart and they think, wow, this is like way too good to be true, right? So today is Monday. So there's two days until a Portland, you can see there's one day and 16 hours left until this thing goes up for auction. Some people jump on here and see, oh my God, a 2011 Jeep, Jeep Compass for $80. Well, not quite. Seller reserve isn't met yet. And you know, you never know if that like, anyway, so that's why some people look on here and think it's too good to be true. If you see one at pure sale and you're watching the auction and it goes for 400 bucks though, it went for $400. Somebody bought that car for $400. Sometimes you'll see it on approval though. I mean, I've seen people that watched like a Nissan GTR and it was on approval and it went for $11,000 and they're like, I can't believe that's real. I don't think it's real that somebody bought a GTR for $11,000. It's probably not the, 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 
seller probably did not approve that final price and it probably went back up for auction the next week. But there are some amazing, amazing deals. I, I love bidding on the pure sale um, auctions. Uh, that's one of my favorite because you just know that it's gonna be, when you get it, you get it. So let's talk about um, uh, vehicle status like types. So I have it right in, in this whole column right here. Um, e is the uh, enhanced vehicles. It's vehicles or sellers authorized copart to per perform some enhancements on it, like washing it, vacuuming, blah, blah, blah. A couple little things. That doesn't really tell you much about the car. R is runs and drives. So that's at the time that the car rolled into Copart, it runs and drives, and now they're not driving it down the street in, in anger. They're just like rolling it a little bit forward, putting the transmission in gear or whatever, gonna roll it a little forward, a little bit backwards, and the engine runs in neutral. I have been in a car before that was marked runs and drives when the engine was clearly blown. It can happen, so you do want to, um, I always advise going to the yard and actually checking out the car if you can. If not, there are these services where you can pay somebody like 50 bucks and they'll go check it out for you. Uh, their yards are open, they have these browsing days, and you can head over to the yard and check it out. So what I do is I build up this list. The last one is engine start program. So this means that at the time of the vehicle arrived at Copart, um, verify that the vehicle started and ran at idle. There's no guarantee that it's gonna run. This is often what happens when you have like a bent susp a suspension component, uh, a blown transmission, which is not common in a wrecked car, not common at all, or you have a piece of metal that has wrecked and uh, kind of blocked a wheel from being able to move. So the Beamer that we bought a long time back, that was just marked as engine start because the fender had bent into the wheel and it was touching the tire, so the tire couldn't move, so it didn't run and drive. Those are good ones to look for if you can find one because um, the ones that are run and drive do go from a higher price. The ones that are start go for a higher price than the ones that are marked with an E or the ones that have no information at all. So that is my tip is one of those things to look for. And um, anyways, so how I try and get my best deals though is also by going to the yard. When you go to the yard, you're gonna have more information under your belt than the remote buyers and the remote bidders. So you might know the value a little bit better. They're gonna have to be a little bit safer. If you're in Montana, you're bidding a car in Oregon you've never seen. But if you're in Oregon and you've checked it out and you know the status of the car, how good it is, you can really get an upper hand on them. So I build a list and the way you can build a list is you can just hit the watch button. So let's say I wanted to watch this Jaguar. You just hit watch. When you go back to your um, dashboard, it's in here right like this. And then you have your lot number. I, uh, I Then I obviously can log in from my phone. So I head off to the auction yard. Um, I normally go the day before the auctions and I have all the lot numbers. I tell the guys at the front desk, Here's all my lot numbers. Can I get the keys to these cars? They give you the keys to the cars. You head out to the yard. You can inspect them yourself. You can turn them on yourself. Some of them will be dead. Some of the batteries are dead. If you ask them nicely, they'll normally let you borrow a jumper pack and you can jump the car, start it, run it, listen to it run, all that good stuff. So that's where um, knowing a little bit about cars, knowing your own like little tip, tips and tricks for inspecting cars and stuff like that really comes in handy. It's a skill that takes a long time to learn and I'm not great at it, but um, that's where, you know, because you can't drive it around a lot, but you can get a lot of information out of the car. I was checking out a Range Rover a long time ago and everything like looked way too good to be true. And then I saw this tiny little oil spot on the ground. And obviously like they're a salvage car, mainly a salvage car company. They do have clean title cars on here, by the way. But anyways, an oil spot is not very rare and very, not very uncommon, but I was like, huh. And it was in, it was right at the back by the exhaust. And I was like, is that really, I wonder. So I, I uh, I hung my head out the window, I revved the car, and I found out that oil was flying out of the exhaust, and I obviously did not buy the car at that point. Um, so that's like, you know, anyways, you, you may uncover all sorts of different things. One thing I will say, though, that's really cool about buying, so that car was actually put up by a private party for sale. So it wasn't even a salvage style car. Somebody brought their, you can bring your car to Copart and sell it at auction. I prefer to buy cars that are, this is just my personal preference here, I prefer to buy cars that were on the road, got wrecked and totaled out by the insurance company. Why? Because no one had ha has had time or anything to do with fiddling with that car before I got there to inspect it. So if somebody takes their private car, they can do all sorts of stuff like engine stop leak and all this terrible stuff that I'd never do to my own car and then they can put it up for sale, try and make it look as good as they can versus somebody's driving down the street, they have a terrible accident, it's unfortunate for them, hopefully they get out just fine and then the car ends up for sale at Copart. Well now I know that how the engine runs is how it was running before. You know, how the car looks is how it, look, it looked before. You can profile a car. Sorry, I'm kind of getting on a tangent here, but you can profile a car by the type of owner that had it. You can even sometimes look at the type of insurance company that salvaged it out. And you can find if somebody was on a shoestring budget or you can find if somebody was um, definitely not on a budget and doing all the correct proper maintenance and stuff like that. One of the best cars I ever had uh, that I bought from Copart was a 
uh, Subaru uh, that had like the OPB donator sticker on the back. It was super, super clean. There was some like some signs of like kids in the back, like crayons and a couple other things. I think there was like some marbles in the back and um, the battery was dead so it wouldn't start at the yard. So I asked Copart if I could jumpstart it. They let me jumpstart, we turned it on. It ran like a clock. I bought that car and it was an awesome, awesome value for me. And so that's one of those things where I profiled. I also knew that they had State Farm Insurance, which is a very expensive insurance company. So they probably weren't uh, pinch and pennies. You can you can even go as far as like looking, make sure all the tires match. Uh, brake pads were changed at the same time. All sorts of crazy stuff that you can think about to try and profile that car and the type of person that had that car, how well they would have taken care of it. And same is true, vice versa. I have bought some real crap cars, and you could tell that the owners did not really care about their car. So you know, if they don't clean out anything inside the car forever, they might be less likely to change the oil. It's just a it's just how it is and that's one of the really cool parts of going down there to copart and investigating the car is you can kind of like play this game of trying to figure out how good it's going to be before you buy it um anyways i went off on quite a tangent there so let me try and reel it back in here so um once you found your car uh and you're going ahead and you're like you well i, I want to talk about damage types but we have been on a tangent for a little bit so let's talk about fees so when you uh f when you're bidding you want to keep in mind in the back of your mind fees okay because they um there are, is a fee that is a attached after you win the bid so let's say you win a bid of on a car for uh let's use four thousand dollars anyways there's a list of fees right here on copart's website they are um they are kind of as stated, so you can look at the final price of the car and look at the fee that adds up to it. So if you buy a $1,200 car, you're looking at probably a, I think it's $415. Um, if you look at D, applies to consumer members using non-secure payment. Oh, you can use secure payment. I always use secure payment. That's like a cashier's check. I head down to the bank, get a cashier's check, cut to Copart, take that down there. That's, that's um, secure payment. And um, uh, an example of non-secure payment is like a Visa credit card. I would not advise doing that because you um, lose a little bit more money. So for instance, it's the 1350 versus the 1415. You can save a little bit of money there. So you're looking at 1350 plus there's a couple little fees. Uh, there's a gate fee um, right here. And then there is internet bidding fee right there. And I don't know what third party finance fee is. I don't ever incur that. So you can add this up real quickly. You can do the math in the back of your head. If you are concerned, you need to stay under a certain budget. You can look at the fees and you can uh, total that up before you commit to buying anything. So um, that's the basics on that. All right, so let's talk about what to look for. I just want to give you guys a quick, this video is going a little bit long, but I do want to give you guys a quick kind of breakdown of what I look for when I'm trying to get a good um, value. So, um, couple things right off the top of my head when a car is dead and the battery is dead at the car at the auction yard ask copart if you can jump it or bring your own jumper pack i really advise just bringing your own jumper pack down to the yard um, and then start it up yourself that can give you a little bit of extra information that a lot of the other people there at the yard probably didn't have you'll know that how the engine sounds um, if the battery's dead on a lot of modern cars you leave the car for four or five days while insurance is figuring out the paperwork for copart while it's at the yard the battery will go dead and then people won't know how the engine sounds and they'll just They'll just write it off. Um, damage types, I think it's really for, I'll say this right up front, for a first car, if you're buying a first car as a project car or something like that, I would try and stay on the cheap side and on the low damage side. That way you can learn your lesson on something cheap. I made the mistake of my first car was a brand new, I think it was in 2014, I bought a 2014 Fiat 500L and um, it was a brand new car. They'd never made it before. Parts were extremely hard to get. The, the budget on it just went skyrocketing and it wasn't even a car that I really wanted. So. It was a very uh, that was a learning experience. So, uh, for instance, so let me let me show you a car like this that I just pulled up. Um, this is probably a good car to like start looking at, but you can see you want to be you want to be careful about this um, frame rail damage right here. Um, but this is this is the type of car that you know you'd be looking for light front end damage where you can probably bolt the things back together, get some headlights in there, get this car back on the road without too much work. These cars are normally exceptional values um, when you're confident of what you're doing. You know the ones where you, they're, they're not, if, if it looks like it doesn't have full on frame damage, which this one doesn't, but it, it's something I would check out in the yard. I would look at that other post and see if it's still straight. If it is though, then you know, you're just looking at a new front impact bar. You're looking at a new hood, buy a hood from a junkyard that has the same color paint. So you don't have to do that. Probably need a new bumper cover, throw a new bumper cover on there, new headlights, and then you got a, a car back under your belt. And um, if I had to guess, where is this car? Um, if I had to guess, this car is a 2005 with how many miles? 
oh it doesn't list the miles you might be able to sometimes you can see the miles on the computer here so this is the type of car where it doesn't have the runs and drives tag on it and it's just marked as e and then the dash is darked out meaning that they probably couldn't get the dash to light up to show the miles when they're taking the photographs. This is something that I would probably stay away from unless you can go to the yard and verify it yourself that these types of things work. Plug in a battery, plug in a new battery, check the dash, all that good stuff. Anyways, but as far as damage goes, these are the types of things that I look for. I also look for, like I said earlier, ones that have um, the kinked uh, metal blocking a wheel. If, uh, if you're looking for a project car and you're blocking a wheel, that way it's no longer listed as runs and drives, just starts. That might get you a good value. Um, if you know a car very well, look at suspension damage. Normally people will run away from suspension damage, especially body shops. That way you're not in a bidding war with any type of a body shop. Um, that's commonly a, a very common massive commercial use for Copart is body shops buy cars. They fix up the body damage, they repaint them, and then they sell them. They have big trouble when it comes to mechanical uh, fixing and stuff like that. They normally steer away from those. So if you are confident of your work with suspension components if you can see that it's just a broken suspension component not a bent up lower subframe or a bent up frame of a car that is a good good buy that's a good one to check out um what else i'm trying to think of other damage type vandalism great damage type to look into sometimes cars get stolen or whatever they get salvaged out due to vandalism i have been able to get awesome buys because of vandalism because the car was basically perfect um i don't know what else but do your research um, and always go check it out at the yard if you possibly can before you buy it. That way you'll know a little bit more. I wish I could think of more stuff off the top of my head as far as the good types of cars to go look for and the ones that are damaged. Oh, the other one that I, I had really good success was with was is um, when it's just look for singled out body panels that are busted up. So if you have just one rear quarter panel or just you know one hood or just the bumper or just a fender and a bumper stuff that you can take off with bolts and put back on obviously going to save you a lot of money but a lot of people will run away from quarter panel damage like i got on the um the first the plan b brz and then um it was really just the main amount of work that i needed to do with that car was replacing the quarter panel and that was it so that was a that was a huge save like i, I saved a bunch of money when i bought that car all right last thing i wanted to show you guys was um the list of copart locations so there's all these ones in the United States. There's basically one in every state, it looks like. Then they have Asia, uh, China, India, shout out to all the Indian viewers, Brazil, um, UAE, Oman, Bahrain, and in Europe they have um, all of these. So I actually have a lot of viewers from the UK, so you guys, um, you're, not, you're not out on this game. You can do this too. I have no idea what the rules are. Uh, the last thing that I want to close out this video by saying is if you have any other questions, um, you can email me, but I wouldn't even advise it because I'm not going to be able to answer them as well as the people at Copart will. One reason I'm so stoked to have them uh, you know, partnering with me, sponsoring this video and other stuff is that I really stand behind this company. I love the employees there. I know some of the employees at the North Portland Copart Yard by name. I don't even buy that many cars, but everybody is super friendly. From the day that I walked in there, like I was nervous and I was just a total noob and I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know which door went out to the yard and which door went to the bathroom and whatever. They showed me around. They taught me all about the different auction types. They have great customer service. They basically held my hand through the whole process like I was a child. And, uh, and they were really cool and they were really nice. And so I have always had a great time with all of their customer service representatives and everything else like that um, through the whole process. So thanks to all the people that work at Copart because you guys are awesome and uh, you make this process really cool for people like me. So, you know, buying project cars, this is by far the best way to do it. If you're going to build a race car, you're going to build a drift car, you're going to do anything, or you just want a cheap car and you're confident on fixing it yourself, you want to get a salvage car, I'd really advise doing it and I'd really advise getting in contact with some people at Copart. Anytime I have a question, I just ring them up. For instance, I was bidding in a car, bidding on a car in Washington very recently, and I just gave them a call, asked them all the questions that I had, they answered them very quickly, and they were very, very nice about it, which is really cool. They are not grumpuses like some other companies are, which I'm not gonna mention, but anyways. So, that's a wrap on that. There is a link to Copart in the description if you are a BS for Builder and you wanna basically say, hey, BS for Build sent me here. That might help me out, I don't know, anyways. But there's a link in the description. Go check it out, browse some cars, get addicted like I am, and buy 10 cars like I have. I'm just kidding, but have a fun time. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe. Have a good day, guys. Bye-bye. Peace.